Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ruby Life Pools Plus 11 during Season 4 of Meeting Plus in Dragonflight. I'll be going through this dungeon from the Restoration Shaman point of view and I'll be talking about the main mechanics on the trash, on the bosses and how you can handle them as a healer. Restoration Shaman feels quite good to play during Season 4, believe it or not. And here at the start we have the Juggernaut who is going to cast Excavating Blast. Always look at your feet because this is a big circle that is going to one-shot you. Up next, as you can see, I'm targeting the Earth Shaper. There are a few of those in these packs and as a Restoration Shaman you have the Cap Totem and you have Thundershock. You want to be watching them and once they start casting their Tectonic Slam, which is not interruptible but you can see it, you should use those skills as that does heavy AoE damage, especially on Fortified Weeks and you can interrupt at least two of these. Other than that, send your interrupts into the Chill Reavers as they are going to be casting Ice Bolts and Shields. And that will require you to do some spot healing to the people that get hit. The more you interrupt, the less spot healing you have to do. And of course, keep your Acid Rain down all the time. It's going to help a little bit with tank healing and of course do a lot of passive damage. Something that I'm not doing right now is dropping my Cloud Burst Totem. As with the current tier set, it actually gives you crit bonus. So even if you don't have to do a lot of healing but you are at 2 charges of the CBT, you should drop one of them down because this is going to help you with the spot healing and with the damage as the crit bonus applies to everything. Over here a tectonic slam goes down but it's not a fortified weak so it's easy to heal through that. And on fortified weeks, you're gonna have bloodlust for this pool so it's going to go down much quicker than it does right now. But since it's Tyrannical Week, we're gonna save the Bloodlust for the first boss over here. Keep in mind that you can use a lot of tools to help you like the CDs of the spells on the nameplates and the Week or a Dungeon Pack for Season 4, which both are going to show you when the next AoE is going to come in the form of a Tectonic Slam. And that is a very useful information because if you're using Thundershock, you have to run into melee to interrupt. And if you're using Cap Totem, that actually has some time before it triggers once it drops it. So you need to be prepared to use both of these to reduce the damage that your group is going to be taking. Over here, we put that Juggernaut. There are routes where you can skip it by just letting it patrol away and run close to the wall. But accidentally or not, this was, this was actually not a very good run, uh, we actually had to deal with it. And yes, spoiler alert, we're going to die a lot and wipe, but I decided to pick this run because it's better to discuss certain situations where things go wrong, it's much easier to talk about a run where everything goes smoothly. So far just one dead, the druid didn't move out from the circle on the ground, so obviously you cannot heal through that. But we are just about to make our first mistake. Here the tank CCs the mob and you can still get aggro on the CC mob if you run close to it. Apparently somebody did that so that mob is going to wipe us a little bit later. But now we are pulling the mini boss. Obviously the biggest thing here is dodge the frontals but also especially on fourth fight week when he starts casting this steel barrage you have to be prepared to heal your tank because it does a lot of damage and you also have to keep moving away from the circles on the ground. Now your tank should be using defensives, you should be able to keep them up by just using riptides on the move, but be prepared to use your spirit walkers grace and spam them hard if things start going south for them. Now I'm going to fast forward here because there were a few big oopsies. The tank pulled the boss even before we killed the mini boss, but then the warlock did not dodge the charge, so he died instantly as we bloodlusted and pulled the boss. He got battle rest into a swirly to die immediately, and shortly after Incorporeos went off and that mob that we CC'd earlier joined the fight to kill the tank. So pretty bad pull, but it is what it is. We did manage to get past the CC'd mob without pulling it this time and engage the boss anew without the bloodlust. Alright, for the first boss here obviously you need to dodge the crystal that she spawns and you can try to stack together so they're not spread all over the place. If you get the Hellstrom which is the big circle around you, you need to run away and you want to pop some kind of a movement ability to get out of the circle quickly so you don't get, take extra damage. Over here I popped my defensive because I didn't have my Windrush Totem. But in general any kind of movement, even Thunderous boss is going to help you a lot. Now your goal here is to top everybody up once the circle spawns because the explosion does even more damage. 
So don't hesitate to use small cooldowns in order to do that. Use your Tidebringer Chain Lightnings for that purpose as well and try to time your Cloudburst. Once the circle explodes, you're in no hurry to heal everybody up to full apart from your tank as they're taking a lot of damage as there is plenty of time until the next circle comes and nobody should be taking extra damage up until that point. You need to heal through two transitions for this boss fight, you should have cooldowns for that. First try to stack near your tanks so they can get aggro on the whelps and then for the first one you can pop a spirit link with ascendance, for this one I just popped my ancestral guidance. And of course don't forget to interrupt boss as soon as the shield is gone as that stops the damage. Back to phase 1, the things that I did mention here, of course Riptide is very powerful to top people off while you're getting sucked in towards the circle and also don't be afraid to start sliding towards the circle. You can keep casting in this process, just make sure there is no crystals between you and the circle as if you hit them you're going to die. The other thing that I'm going to mention is that on high tyrannical keys this fight could actually be quite long. So when you're trying to top off people, if you can afford it, try to do it with your healing waves and rely more on the riptides as of course chain heal is very expensive. In the meantime, I panicked here a little bit so I popped my ascendance, I was planning to save that for a transition but that's coming up closely as well so I'm still going to use some of the healing to get through the damage of the shield. I'm also popping my healing tight here because it's relatively low key and I can easily heal through the chill storm circles. Of course the druid died earlier because he couldn't get away on time. And if you know that somebody's struggling with getting away from the circle, you can use your windrush totem to help them and you can also pop your spirit walkers of grace and spam heal them while they're trying to get away just to make sure that they're not dying. And the last thing to mention here. Of course try to stack your crystals and once you get the circle run to the opposite direction so there are no people that are gonna be stuck between the circle and a crystal. Alright enough for this boss I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. We managed to kill it with 4 people rest the druid and go up to the ring that spawns the second boss. Make sure to sit down and drink as soon as the boss dies because there's a short RP until the dragons come down and take you up and you're gonna be low on mana, especially on tyrannical keys. Now the first uh, mini boss here is the uh, Thunderhead Dragon. You're likely going to be late to the party because you are drinking so be careful not to eat the frontal as you're running into him. And once he spawns the two debuffs, dispel one of them as quickly as possible, assuming everybody stopped before that point, and then try to spam heal everybody up to full health as the second one is going to expire and do another portion of AoE damage. All of this of course hurts a lot more on fortified keys and he also has a thundering jaw which is a tank buster, again on fortified keys you might watch your tank a little bit because they're going to take a lot of damage. There's also routes and strategies that allow you to skip this mini boss but that also makes the second boss fight much harder later on so let's just say that's advanced tactics and we're going to recommend killing this in your packs. Alright the packs that follow are actually very nasty. The first thing you want to watch for is one of the party members is going to get the bomb. You want to spam heal them as they'll be taking ticking damage and then they're going to explode for even more damage. However, you want to bring that bomb on top of the packs as it knocks the mobs up. That's why I'm standing close here in case I get it, I want to be quick to run in and explode on top of the mobs. It's very important to do so to interrupt the cinder bolts which do a lot of single target damage but also the flame dancers are going to cast something called flame dance. This one is not interruptible, you can only see it and if you knock them up that's going to do the job. As you saw we didn't have enough CC here because we pulled the flame dancer late and it exploded doing a lot of damage, luckily it's not fortified keys so it's healable. But on hide fortified keys that's probably going to be a wipe. The other thing they're going to do is called Blaze of Glory, they cast that as they're just about to die and you want to purge that as they start doing AoE damage in a short area and they also spawn swirlies on the ground that you have to dodge. That continues until they have the shield active but it's hard for melee to DPS it down as they do damage around them so purging it is the best way to go. On top of everything the destroyers are going to keep casting Inferno which is not interruptible, you will just have to heal through that damage and that happens constantly throughout these packs so be prepared 
and even call your tank to slow down if you're low on mana between packs as it's going to be very very intensive especially on fortified weeks obviously when the uh, big elementals die make sure to run away from the circle and also be aware that you can have the bomb before that and if you explode in the circle and land inside you can easily die I got lucky in this situation and the small elementals that were fighting are very annoying because they're not going to let you drop combat easily and start drinking if you need to. Now you saw the other mini boss flying on top of us, you don't want to pull that no matter what week it is because it's going to be extra percentage and this mob can actually be very scary on fortified weeks because as it reaches 50% it starts doing a ramping AoE damage which could be lethal if you fail to DPS it down quickly. You want to pull on these stairs over here so you're away from the patrolling path of the dragon and you don't accidentally pull it and once the destroyer dies you can just run down the stairs in case the dragon is blocking your path. The tips that I can give you here is keep interrupting the cinder bolts as you cannot knock every single one up and also save your thundershock or cap totem for the flame dancers in case the bomb doesn't work on them for whatever reason somebody doesn't run in or they start casting their flame dance late after you knocked everybody up. Now over here we make another big mistake, it's okay to slow down this point, wait for the dragon to patrol and then run safely across. We try to pull the destroyer over so we rush and we go ahead of the dragon, but somebody was slow, we pulled it, it killed us with the frontal, we had two destroyers on top of each other because we couldn't finish the first one, so everything becomes very chaotic if you don't play this area correctly, it's better to slow down and waste a few seconds instead of wiping. Now as a healer you'll be pressing all of your buttons here and it's up to your tank to be careful because if they pull the next pack and you don't have enough CC for the flame dance and then it goes off, it's also wipe. And especially on tyrannical keys you should be careful because you need to have at least one cooldown going to the next boss as it's also a very intensive healing fight. However, don't hesitate to use your cooldowns on the packs, especially in fortified weeks as this is probably the hardest part of the dungeon in that scenario. And if you happen to wipe as we did, keep in mind that depending on the progress that you did around the circle you can go the other way and not bother with the patrolling dragon. In this specific point I was very upset with the tank because he didn't wait for the destroyer to die, he basically wiped us by rushing forward and I was talking to Derringer telling him hey maybe we should leave the key but he was like yeah let's see what happens and uh as we're going to see, he was right, we actually managed to damn it. Now we're approaching this from the other side, it's a double pull, that's actually very scary because you have three casters here, you have uh, two flame dancers and of course you have the destroyer, so it's crucial here for the bomb to knock the mobs up and you should be using all of your CC in order to interrupt and stop the flame dancers. Obviously you don't have to pull all of those at once and also if you have enough trash percentage because you pulled the second dragon or you pulled more in the first area, you can go left on your screens right now and skip the patrolling pack that we pulled on top of the destroyer as only killing the destroyer packs is required in order to summon the boss. Over here though we managed because it was not fortified weak and keep in mind that the small elementals can keep you in combat here, make sure to yell at your tank because you want to be full mana before pulling the boss, especially on Tyrannica weak, as I mentioned that's another big healing check. Over here it's the spiteful that keeps us in combat, but again it's crucial for you to be at full mana, especially on higher keys. Now usually I have bloodlust for this boss and this fight is all about positioning. You want to be standing in the direction that you came from in order to summon the fire elemental there and after that you want to bait the boulder in the same direction but not on top of the elemental as I'm standing here, I got lucky that I didn't get targeted because you're going to impede your melee in order to hit the elemental. When it comes to healing the elemental is going to cast inferno and you want to put some healing into the group but you don't necessarily have to top everybody up. You have to do enough healing so they survive the dot that the inferno puts on them and then you want to focus on your tank as the searing blows that the boss casts are actually doing a lot of damage to them. Timing your cloud burst with the infernos of course is crucial but don't hesitate to use cooldowns on every inferno to keep everybody healthy including your tank. 
Now we also need to interrupt the destroyers in order for them not to do even more AoE damage and usually I let the first interrupt to be the melee, the tank, whatever and then I'm just a backup for the second, especially as I'm ranged. And it's not unheard of for the melee to start running away from the destroyer earlier before it actually dies. Other than that, keep baiting the destroyers and you can drop your healing rain on top of them as soon as they spawn and then use your Typebringer chain lightnings to keep everybody alive once the inferno goes off. As they will be benefiting from your deluge talent if they're staying inside of your healing rain. And then also remember to bait the boulders every time you're running away from the inferno make sure you're running at an angle towards the wall so the boulder doesn't run down the path that you want to take in case you're the one targeted. The sequence of the bosses always summons an elemental first then there's one boulder another boulder and then another elemental. That keeps repeating and as I said it's very important for every second of the fight for you to be aware where you're standing as yes it's a healing check but you're also going to wipe if you surround yourself with a fire and there is nowhere to run. As you saw I managed to heal through few infernos without a cooldown as again this is relatively low key but usually you want to start with ancestral guidance as this is going to come back later on the fight and you can use it twice and then you can follow up with either ascendance, spirit link totem, healing tide totem and don't forget to use your defensive if you're low on healing and you can also pop your spirit walkers grace and heal everybody up while you're running away from the exploding destroyers. Last but not least you might come to a point where somebody calls let's dps the boss and ignore the destroyer as this is exactly what's going to happen over here. In that case make sure that you're still healing through the inferno of course but also watch the destroyer for the interrupt. At this point obviously your melee and the tank are going to be distracted and hitting the boss so it's probably going to be up to you to do the extra interrupts. Alright so far so good but there's a lot more to trash to go through and of course the last boss which is also challenging. In the next area you're going to encounter small storm elementals you can purge their shield but keep in mind that as soon as you do that they're going to charge to the furthest player standing away and they will also do that if the shield is DPS down so be prepared to dodge some swirlies. Try to interrupt the channelers as much as you can and once they start casting lightning storm it's your time to shine because you have to do a lot of healing to keep everybody up through the AoE. Cloudburst of course is essential here and also don't hesitate to use your defensives that's why they're there for. And you can also commit the cooldowns that come back up from the boss that you just fought. You are going to need cooldowns for the last boss but the first phase there is not that intensive so you have time for them to rotate back on. As you can see the mob didn't die on time here we are going through the second lightning storm and that is going to be the case on hide fortified keys as well so be prepared to do a lot of healing. Now usually you don't want to do double pool here you have to interrupt the flame channelers as if their cast goes off they're going to do a lot of single target damage and leave a dot on the target which is exactly what happened here and then there is another channeler at the back that is also going to do a lot of AoE. You also need to spot heal your melee as the storm warriors do a small area damage around them. So you have to be on your toes the whole time and of course you have to keep dodging these small elementals. You usually want to clear the sides the left and the right here so you have more space to fight the boss later. You can skip these but then it's a bit tricky if you pull them during the boss fight. Also another important note here the tempest channelers you cannot stun the ones that cast the lightning storm but you can stun the flame channelers so that's another way to interrupt them using your thunder shock or cap totem. And these pools are much easier if you do them uh, one after the other. Keep in mind that the mobs are quite close to each other so be careful not to butt pull something or something to cleave and get an extra mobs when you're not expecting them. You want to get some mana before you pull the next pack which has the last mini boss of the dungeon. It has a couple of storm warriors, it has some of the small elementals and the mini boss is going to keep summoning those small elementals. 
So that's another reason for you to run Burge in this dungeon so you can get rid of their shields as at some point he's going to absorb their shields and do an area and effect damage if you don't burst to the absorbed amount. Now he's also going to do lightning storm as you can see over here. This one hurts even more than the others so be prepared to heal through that. He has more health than the regular channelers so uh, you're going to go through several uh, lightning storms for sure. And of course you want to keep interrupting him as the shock blast leaves a debuff on whoever is targeted that increases the damage that they take. The ability that absorbs the shield of the small elementals on the side is called Tempest Storm Shield so if you're pulling extras from the side make sure you're not doing that as he's just about to cast that because he's going to absorb their shields if they're not purged and then if he finishes the cast before you burst to the shield you're going to wipe as it does a ton of damage. This mob is very nasty on fortified weeks so be prepared to commit some cooldowns in order to live through the lightning storms. And then make sure you sit down and drink as soon as it dies as there is a short RP before the boss is actually summoned. Of course if it's not uh, spiteful weak and they keep you in combat. Alright and as for the last boss it starts in phase 1 with two mobs the Erkhart human and the dragon Kuraka. They do not share health, you wanna burst down the dragon as quickly as possible, after that the fight is basically over. But some cleave to the human is going to help as well. Now the dragon is occasionally going to do frontals so be aware of that at all times and make sure you don't get caught. You also have to dispel your tank at all times. And watch for the interrupting cloud burst cast, I actually have a weak word that tracks that separately with a voice alert. As this does a lot of AoE damage but it also silences you if you're casting when it goes off. Now the other important weak aura in the middle of the screen is telling me where I should go next if I get the debuff from the dragon which drops the fire puddles on the ground. That's gonna be even more important later on in the fight but you want the winds that follow up to actually blow the puddles off of the platform so you don't have to deal with them later. Once the winds start, same thing as the first boss, don't hesitate to get pushed away while you're casting as long as you don't go off of the platform and here as you can see I'm getting the debuff whoever gets the debuff you wanna spot heal them and top them up so they don't die from the AoE of the cloud burst. You should be able to heal to phase 1 relatively easy just spot heal whoever gets the debuff and then chain heal the rest of the group after the cloud bursts. Being aware of your positioning so you don't drop puddles on the wrong place or you get blown over a fire puddle. As soon as one of the bosses hits 50%, preferably the dragon, they're going to go into the middle of the platform and Erkart is going to mount Karaka. From this point on they're going to be next to each other at all times and the dragon is going to jump up and do flame spits. This is where you have to be very careful because now there's two people that are getting the debuffs and here the weak ore is going to help you a lot because it's going to show you the location where you want to stack them, drop the puddles on top of each other and then heal everybody up. The dragon is still going to do the frontal, Erkart is still going to cast the cloud burst and the winds are still gonna be blowing. So now you want to rotate through your cooldowns one after the other and hopefully you kill the dragon before you run out of steam. Obviously the healing needs to happen when the flame spits are active and if people are spread that could become very chaotic because you might be outranged, you might be behind a puddle and not being able to reach your teammates and unfortunately that's what usually happens in bugs but press every button that you have in your spellbook and don't forget that you still need to keep dispelling your tank from the storm strikes that Erkhart cast as he's going to be taking increased damage if you don't do so. Following the weak aura that tells you where to drop the puddles actually helps a ton in this fight of course if people do it and your spirit walker's grace is also going to be a huge game changer if you need to heal on the move dodging some of the puddles. Once the dragon dies though it's quite easy, you're still going to have the winds and the cloud burst is going to do AoE damage but you have plenty of time to top everybody up. So as long as you keep dispelling your tank you should be totally fine. That will be the short walkthrough for ruby life pools, restoration shaman point of view, let me know if you like this content and you want to see more of it, maybe with different classes and specs and of course different dungeons. Thank you very much for watching, I'll see you in the next video, now get out of here.